and I put my notes down. Hello, friends. Welcome to our weekly data talk. We are talking to data science leaders from around the world. And I got to tell you, I'm super hyped about this guest. We've been trying to get her on the show for a very, very long time. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Nico Yuck. We're talking about the art and science of creating intelligent data visualization. I'm sorry. The art and science of creating intelligent data visualizations. And if you haven't heard yes. of Nico yet, she's the co-founder and CEO of BI Brains and the co-founder of the Analytics in Fire community and podcast. She's also the author of the Data Visualization for Dummies book, but you can see that in the background. She's a mover, she's a shaker, a data visualization storyteller, popular keynote speaker. And if I could speak in emojis, I would have like fire emoji, fire emoji, hands up, hands up. I am so excited to have Miko You're as our awesome. guest today. What's up, Miko? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited to be here. I'm so sorry this took so long. Um, I'm just super excited to be here. Thank you for the patience. Love. Oh, no. I love the experience data talk. I was just telling you before I started binge watching it a few weeks ago, and I was pretty impressed. Thank you. Well, it's an honor to have you uh, with us. So as, as you know, um, in every show, we always ask our guests, like, tell us a little bit about your journey that brought you into data science. Okay, so mine is pretty short and sweet. Um, so for just to clarify a few things, I'm actually a recovering data scientist that then became a- <laughs> What? <laughs> I've so, never heard okay, of this. Okay, so the story goes like this, I'll keep it short. At 23, I came out of college with a computer engineering degree. I then went into a job where I was told I was a senior research analyst where I sat and did regression and T models in SAS mainframe all day and reported the scores to Forbes, okay, which they okay. then published in a magazine. And so at that time, I was in a department with five people. Um, there was only one other person around my age. Everybody else was about 30, 40 years my senior. I was locked in like this office. And wow. yeah, it was, and then my and then my boss, Lovin, made me take PhD statistics classes at night. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So that was what data scientist was. No one actually knew what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd go to like dinner, hang out, then everybody talk about their jobs, right? You're like, yeah, yeah. I'm programming this, I'm doing that. And then like, we go, what do you do? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I, I run these models, right? And, <laughs> uh, and, and in SAS like, and no one ever heard of SAS. Yeah. And so, yeah, that was interesting. So that lasted for a period. And then I fell into this world called BI. And the funny part about it is when you start up as, I think, a data scientist, your brain is wired to have verification of numbers. I went to BI and everybody was wired in their gut. So it was okay to like say the number felt wrong. And I went crazy. Mm. <laughs> People were pulling numbers out of Excel sheets like no tomorrow. <laughs> so I became like this kind of like, like what, I don't know what you call it. Like I, I went crazy for a little while because I couldn't yeah. understand how people would just fabricate numbers, right? And so where I am today is I think I've kind of meshed that um, foundation that I had with having to verify numbers to, to a specific point, prove correlation, prove causation, right? Because when you're doing IBM mainframe SAS, you're doing the real thing. There's no hacks. They have so many <laughs> tools today. It's amazing, right? And then coming to BI where people are just gut analysis numbers, gut analysis numbers, I just, Mike, I was considered a troublemaker. Oh, I, I could ask I them, tell. I could tell. How did you get the number? Yeah. How did you get it? Good. <laughs> Yeah, you're asking the right questions. So, do you still Show find? Do, yeah. <laughs> do you still find that happening today? Like leaders still relying on gut instinct? Uh, just probably a couple. I don't want to be too clear in my time analysis. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. get fired. Um, recently, <laughs> within a time span, I had someone tell me the number feels wrong. Mm. And I went. Hey, what so do you say to that? So I tell them numbers don't get the flu. They don't have an EQ. <laughs> I'm going to tweet that. Numbers don't, don't get have, the flu. <laughs> they don't have emotions, right? I said yeah. human beings do. Yes. So I told them, right? I said, if you don't like the number, then say that. But don't tell me it feels wrong. Mm. Yeah, that's smart. That's smart. Yeah, because I think like, I mean, I run into the same thing just on the social media side. Like everything we do has to be data driven. Like we have to make decisions based yes. on the data. 
and gut instinct is just opinion. And if you're just going off your own opinion, gut instinct, like you could be doomed for failure because you have no data to back up what it is you're doing. You know what we, you know what I do? So because we work with, with big enterprises, you know, your fortune 500, what I have started doing a couple of years ago is I simply tell them when I get, when I get pushback, I go, listen, just for the record, the founders of Blockbuster, they also had a feeling that they were doing well. My space felt it was doing well. A matter of fact, Blockbuster thought it was doing well. And Barnes and Noble still think they're doing well. Mm. You know, <laughs> listen, I mean, retail apocalypse is real. Okay. So I tell them those feelings, they're not sustainable and they don't produce results. And so if you've done what you've always done, right, yeah. you're going to get what you don't, you've always got. And mm. so that's the way I sometimes have to explain it and break it down to leaders without being rude. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. tell me about, you know, you were obviously doing data science before it was a popular term. You start BI Brains mm -hmm. and tell us about that process. So it's interesting. I, I went, so, so to put it this way, I came out of this data science world per se, but couldn't leave the brain work behind. So I kind of kept asking the same questions that people in BI weren't accustomed to answering, right? Including dissecting people's spreadsheets and doing things that people weren't really interested in doing in my role in BI. And then telling people it's wrong. And then going down into the formula, digging it out <laughs> and proving it's wrong. <laughs> Um, so I started out as this kind of consultant. I actually, at that point, was um, working as a consultant for uh, Business Objects, which is owned by SAP now. The year that I was in Subjects, I was actually in January, the top 1% in the world. Oh, wow. And I think it was just becoming known. Yeah, eventually I went. So I started out as kind of having fun with data visualization in the BI world to becoming the chick that fixed big problems. So I would go into these big companies where literally there'd be like a war of like, I paid for my data warehouse. I have nothing to show, make it come out and turn those projects around. Mm -hmm. And then I go to the next. One. And so when SAP acquired business objects, long story short, um, they kind of changed the foundation of the community. And I had started my own online community at that point. And so at that point, customers were coming saying, can you help us? Can you support us? And between that, between that request and our community is how the company evolved. Now, there's a little bit of a joke about that, which I tell sometimes, which is when I started my blog, when we started having big companies write us, we thought that they were hackers from Nigeria and Russia. <laughs> Why? Why is that, Miko? Because so she's laughing because we were on Blogger. I sat down one night as a techie. I used to uh -huh. build websites at 12, put together a blog, and then you get a company like Disney writing you, right? And at that point, everybody what? had gotten a Nigerian scam asking right. you to send money. Yeah. So I if you were emailing me asking for dashboard help through a little blog on Blogger with bad <laughs> formatting, what am I supposed to think, right? Yeah. Right. But that's amazing. That's amazing. Like you start a blog on a whim, then you're getting contacted by big companies like Disney, and you're like, "There's no way." It just never stopped. So even today, most of our lead generation is word of mouth or by social media. So our company more evolved out of necessity and need, um, mm -hmm. and a community. For a while, this is embarrassing. We didn't even have a website. Our customers asked us to get a website so they could wow. refer us. These are, these are these are your Fortune 500. Wow. Yeah. Well, man, slightly well, this different. Is, this just shows you that you're doing everything data driven. You're like waiting. You're waiting for the customers to tell you you need a website. Okay, I got my data. I'll build one. Yes. <laughs> yes. So there, and then we developed like our own methodology, the BA dashboard formula methodology, and that methodology is really how I became known globally, going around the world teaching people. I became really so 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 coming into that world and loving database. I kept seeing people having problems, like they they would either um be get too caught up in the data, they'd want to create visualizations, they were ugly, they'd create it, no one would use it. And I basically got frustrated and I took what I was doing as a consultant, put it into a methodology with all of my templates. And mm. that today is the foundation for our company. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. Yeah. So, so that's how BI Brains came to be. That's beautiful. And, and now you're getting asked, I mean, you're so busy. 
I, me- I remember when I first contacted you for the show, like you're always traveling, Sorry. you're speaking, you're consulting. Um, tell us about yeah. like your, your like kind of day to day. Like what, what are you, what are you up to? So as we speak, um, two years ago, I had a, I wanted to go global. So I decided to open up an office in South Africa, then one in London, then one in the wow. Caribbean. Now that was two years, that was about a year and a half to two years ago. Um, the last to open up recently. And so what that is, is a very extensive test in sleep deprivation. Oh. I've had, I've had what you call triplets. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. How? Wait, wait, no, yeah, wait, it's wait, a wait, lot wait. of work. But before you go on, like, how did you choose those locations? Because you're so data driven minded. Yeah. So there were, first of all, I had spoken at all of them for multiple years and kind of okay. garnered the response. We mm-hmm. have a very vocal community, right? So people send us what I call Dr. Root love letters, kind of like around the world. And so I saw not just the opportunity for growth there, but I really fell in love with the communities, mm-hmm. to be quite frank. And by the way, for those, countries that I haven't said anything to. I don't want anybody to hit me nasty emails because we have a lot of fans in other countries. Um, <laughs> it's not that I skip those countries. No, seriously, we do. It's just that those countries to me were some of the most viable, right? We got, and also I was all around the globe hopping and that also had to slow down a little bit. So, you know, as you consult, as you speak and advise, you know, big global companies on, data visualization techniques and better ways of of displaying data to tell better data stories. Can you kind of talk a little bit about what you mean by, because the title of this this episode is Intelligent Data Visualizations. I remember when we were emailing back and forth, you were very clear, like that should be the title. Because originally I wrote down effective data visualizations. You're like, no, 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 not effective, intelligent. So can you kind of get into that, what what you mean? Yeah, the reason I was specific is because back probably about 10 years ago, there was a there was this idea that because something was pretty a data viz, it was all of a sudden great and useful. You remember that error? Mm. Oh, that looks great, but nobody's using it. <laughs> it looked great for the first couple of days, right? And so I think what we've done today, which is fantastic, is we've kind of evolved from this. And, 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 and let me address the word effective. Effective is great, but to me, it's too vague. It has too much of a vague understanding. When you say intelligent, it basically depicts the fact that people expect the work to be done for them. When something's intelligent, it's adding value. When it's effective, I feel like I have to do work. And so the premise around intelligent data visualization, and this is what we teach, is number one, it needs to give answers, not send people on a fishing trip. I'm really, I've been adamant about this for years. Before AI became so prevalent, I've been telling people the difference between a data visualization that's intelligent and one that's not is that it gives answers, okay? When I look at it, I know what to do. Fast forward to where we are in 2018 with the prevalence and evolution of machine learning and AI, it actually can also provide actions that are measurable and outcomes, right? So have you heard of like insights as a service? Mm -hmm. I asked. Mm-hmm. You have, right? So that's so one of the things that's so funny I've been teaching for years is we have this kind of four-part storyboard canvas. It's actually, sorry, we use a lot of them in the office. So there's one on the wall. And so we focus on this story, data story that has your goal, it has your KPIs, it has your causes, and then your actions, right? And one of the things I've been preaching literally for eight years before it was popular, as I said to people, today when we do these stories, they're very subjective. So we pull SMEs in a room, based on their experience, right? We ask them, why do you think something happened, right? And then they'll say, oh, it happened here and here and here. The beautiful thing about things like insight as a service, this data modeling, is now we can incorporate not just one type of data, which I call, some people call it our existing data, right? But I think they miss that most of corporate today has existing data in a database and HI people's Mm -hmm. intuition, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now you can marry in what I consider to be unstructured data, which is, oh, it's caused by the weather. It's caused by dimmer lights, et cetera. And you can marry in benchmark data from outside within the industry, bring that together in real time and get real reasons and results. I'm super excited about that. That's what you call intelligent. It's Mm. not what people are seeing. It's what you need to see that you're not seeing that's incorporated in to help generate actions. I'm very passionate about that. 
how, how do you deal with, I mean, one of the, one of the issues that, that comes up quite a bit is people that are creating data, data visualizations, trying to tell a story based on, again, subjective opinion, like they have an idea of what the data should be saying. Bias creeps in, right? Opinion creeps in. Yes. How do how do you how do you consult people to like avoid running into those errors? So it's interesting. I think that for immature, let's see with immature and mature, because okay. we know the maturity in the US, in my opinion, and again, I'm not offending customers, heavy base of it is sitting where you are, out in the out in the bubble is what I call it, right? Um, and outside the bubble when we do with corporations, a lot of times we have to engage people's EQs. We simply cannot ignore them because the reality is that I've walked into Fortune 20 companies who bought Salesforce Einstein. It sat in private executive meetings where they're asking me. Einstein is literally telling my salespeople, these customers churn and they will not call them and make a move. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're like, I don't understand. We then lose the customer. I look at them and go, why didn't you call? It told you. And they'll go, well, we've been working with them for years. I didn't just because a system tells me, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think what we have is there's a lag between, there's a trust lag, right? Mm -hmm. The system is telling you it, it's proven it's right. People still are doing it. So to answer your question around that, I, I really do think that there has to be a marriage, which is why we reach out to work with people to engage their HI and incorporate it so they feel that they have ownership. Marry that into your AI. And I think that that's where you actually can get a level of intelligence until their trust builds up. And then you can go full robot on them. The full mm -hmm. robot stuff, I'm telling you, in when you go into real world implementation, it's not that easy. Mm. <laughs> we're about, I think we're about a generation away. I think like my little niece and they don't speak English anyway. They speak what I call teenage hieroglyph hieroglyphics. Mm. I think they, <laughs> I think they <laughs> I love these terms. <laughs> teenage hieroglyphics. Teenage, right? Well, this, well, this is the, uh, this is the hands up emoji. Yeah. Hands up emoji, right? They speak in emojis and hieroglyphics. They grew up on Snapchat. They're not going to need licenses. They're going to get in cars. Don't care if anybody's in the front, right? Yeah, They're yeah. the generation where, oh, my phone told me to call. Yeah, hello, I'm calling you. But this generation we're in, we got, we have, there's a passing that has to happen. Like, that's the truth. The mentality is there's still fear. There's still, you know, there's a lot of things happening. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah. What do you say? What do you think in like 10, 15 years from now we'll be in a, I think it's a generation off? right after us to be quite frank. Okay. I think we're kind of that cut off and that generation right after us as in leadership. I, and, and again, it's not all of them, but it's a lot of them. Yeah. They have the past. And I think a new generation will be a bit more trusting and at minimum was all right. What we've been doing hasn't been working. So we'll try to we'll try to robot. But right now, you know, you see these stupid headlines, robots are coming for your jobs. Mm -hmm. robots are going to take over. And I always ask people and I say, listen, because the robot is doing the job, it doesn't mean that you can't do something more intelligent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Robots can overtake a skill set. I hate when they say jobs. It can replace a skill. You have other skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually saw something on LinkedIn, Miko. It was like, are you more afraid of artificial intelligence or human intelligence? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, right? <laughs> it's flawed. That's what I'm saying. You know, I love HI and we have it, but one has a lot of flaws. I mean, it's, you know, it's something that people get a little, oh, well, I've been working here for 20 years. Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying it's a problem. You yeah. get this business hands down. What I'm saying is your competition today are like this, but they simply are street. They're going to pass you. The data is talking. Yeah, yeah. So how would you, um, you know, since I, I like how you put out that there's this generation gap and this next generation that's coming up, how can how can leaders today kind of start preparing to, you know, to shape this new generation of leadership coming up that's going to be maybe more data driven, more uh, interacting with bots and more comfortable with it? 
first of all, you can't have people who are not in that generation in your high level team trying to create stuff for them. Mm. It's always amazing to me, right? I go into senior leadership and it looks good. Everybody has the same, like, you know, gray hair. It looks great. But I always question and go, and then I hear things like this. We don't know how to deal with millennials. You know, we like think about it. Millennials right now, <laughs> they are literally caving down Gen X. Um, be, um, what you might call it, consumer product good companies, right? They are mm-hmm. literally putting them at task. And I always mm-hmm. say, listen, if you want to sell a soda pop to a millennial, you should <laughs> probably have one here <laughs> managing right. that because they're going to recommend things that you don't even understand. They sound stupid. They're unconventional. And you're thinking, I'm not going on Snapchat in a Coca-Cola suit outside the office. I'm popping it in the sun on Skittles. <laughs> Right? Boom. Yeah. 20 million views viral, and all of a sudden, everybody's yeah. buying the soda. They yeah. don't get it. Yeah. It's so funny, Miko. I was at a conference, and one of the panels was like, it was like around like how to market to millennials, and it was geared for bankers. Who and was on the panel? I don't know. I don't remember who was on the panel, but I will tell you that the subheading was we have a real life millennial on the panel and it was almost like like an animal like a creature like we have a <laughs> you know what i mean we have a real life millennial like <laughs> you know i thought i was cracking up i was like it's just a person you know <laughs> so, well i mean at least they got it right but, but yeah. that's what it's becoming right and the, the worst part is that millennials i'm a millennial it's the gen xers that are going to shake them down he's <laughs> These are the kids who are going on Facebook Live in their underwear working. Yeah, and yeah. And they have yeah. the filters. Yeah, yeah. No yeah. filters. <laughs> I know. And there's, yeah, there's like the good and the bad that goes with that. You know, the good is like the authenticity, the trust, the transparency, speaking your mind, which can be used for good. But obviously, there's also the bad that we see with this yeah. early Snapchat gener- generation, et cetera. Yes. Um, but yeah, you're right. So I think that generation gap, Mike, there has to be a passing. But for the ones today, I do feel that there is hope. I just think that, you know, we're seeing, you know, I I keep referring to the retail apocalypse because I track it very closely. And Mm -hmm. I always look at why are certain companies like Amazon and these companies, they have a department where data is king. They, They don't care what people say. If the, if the data doesn't say it, it doesn't <laughs> matter, right? And and, and, right. and that takes a certain, you know, your ego is in the garbage. It, there's nothing to do with human beings. So, you know, I think that culture has to become a bit prevalent, put it that way. So, yeah. Sorry, my, okay. the cleaning guy is here for the office. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I was going to say, like, yeah, that's definitely, like, you know, here at Experian, definitely there's been a huge culture shift where everything that we do at Experience has to be data-driven. It's like you might have an opinion, but you got to back it up with stats, back that's it up with awesome. data. And that's the way that we are making all of our decisions. Um, but the and, thing is, Mike, and I'll say this, there yeah. are leaders, and I've met quite a few and work with a few who say that, yeah. right? But they they say that, but then in the leadership, and I've sat, you know, remember I do executive advisory yeah. and coaching as well. The, the leaders are important to them will present the data and then add their feeling on it. And because that leader doesn't want to lose that person, they acquiesce. Mm. And I see this all the time. I'm sitting all the time texting the CEO like, hey, we talked. Like, I showed mm. you this before we got in here, right? And then they write me and go, I hear stuff like, Miko, one day you'll understand, right? Mm. You're going to be this humongous <laughs> leader. You, you'll understand that something, some things are more important. You can't lose your troops. And so that's, you know, like it's this yeah. choice between, and so those type of battles. Yeah, that, that's rough. I think you get, yeah, yeah, they get in the middle of, they get in the middle of progress. And that gets back to what you were saying about the EQ, like when you're dealing Correct. with somebody, right? Understanding Correct. the emotions behind decisions that are being made, that's going to impact everything. And then that you're being brought in as consultant to help make some smart decisions to drive the business. But in the background, you have, emotions and employee politics and all these other things at play that are impacting, you know, the advice you're telling them what you need to do. Yes. 
Yes, correct. And one thing as well as interesting from a culture perspective is I always tell people because they people ask a lot, you know, I go in as this, I used to be the data viz chick and I tell them being successful in data viz is less about pretty dashboards and more about tapping into people's EQ. I did a lot of homework mm. on EQ, a lot, Oh, a lot. I told them, I said, if you look at a successful consultant engagement and you're doing it where it's like a super success, it's about 40 to 50% EQ and people management, and the rest is actually the work. If you don't get the first part right, no matter what you produce, it's not gonna work. And that's again, where I think in these enterprise cultures, where the evolution of AI has a little bit, it, it hits a wall sometimes. You know, because again, you have people and generations who are wanting to be involved, wanting to have control. The minute you pull control, they kind of feel like, oh, I'm a robot, I'm replaceable. And what mm -hmm. you're saying is, listen, because you're now being told what to do by a smarter system, you're not replaceable, right? What it allows you to do is expand your capacity, expand mm -hmm. your value. But that mentality, I've seen it a lot, is very, it, it's, you know, it's not as prevalent in certain groups. I can tell mm -hmm. you that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm actually excited for to have more bots and more AI working with me to be because it's like that could free up a lot of menial tasks so that we can be focused on strategy, focused on analyzing the data, and it'd be great That's to have great. AI helping with all those different efforts. So I'm, I'm actually very excited about the future. We're not there yet, but I'm excited about where things are headed. But I understand. Me too. But I totally understand the other the other side where people are scared of losing jobs. But like you said, it's a skill set. And as humans, we have lots of other skills. And for those of us that want to remain in the workforce, we have to constantly be evolving and adapting Correct. and growing. Correct. It's like schooling should never end for us. Correct. I Listen, um, I have a little joke to tell you. So I, right now I'm fascinated with chatbots. I don't mean to plug them live on here, but they're yeah, probably- Go people. for it, go for it. Because I actually go to three websites and play with the bots. I oh, go to do? Drift. I go to drift.com all the time and I try to screw with the bot. <laughs> Are you found any good ones? Go to Drift. Go to you Drift? Know, do you, do you, yeah, do you know what Drift is? No, no. Yeah, Drift is like intercom on steroids, basically, right? Oh. And that little bot is cute and he's smart. I try to game him on different, um, on different, yeah, I know it's super geeky, whatever. He's smart. <laughs> I try to game him on different browsers. He's caught me or you're back. I go to different pages. I've been fascinated. I've been playing, obviously intercom is one of the more well-known ones. Um, yeah. They're a bit more knowledgey, but Drift bot, he's cute and he's smart. See, I love this. Amika, so while... You're busy like learning and growing with the chat bots. I'm I'm playing Fortnite with my son. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I think I don't have a life, but he trust me, if you go play with him and start typing random stuff, he's very cool. He reminds That's me of cool. when I got to play with Watson. I've got to play with Watson a oh, bit. Have. My... Oh really? So, oh, so so one of my friends at IBM wanted to show me how Watson auto generates with data immediately. So I actually got to go in and kind of type inquiries and Watson was outputting the data with the text on the bottom. And how, how was that experience? It was great. Watson's smart. And when he when Watson put it out, he also added other context from the internet immediately. Ooh. Oh, wow. Yeah. See, that's that's cool. A little bit. It's a toy, man. Toy junkie. Yeah, that's awesome. I've only had, I've had like limited... Um, um time with different bots like there was a it was an ibm watson but it was like a they brought in a bot about a year ago into our office to kind of sell it for like trade shows because they were saying like if you have nice. this bot at your trade show booth it's kind of cool and innovative and the bot would um quickly scan you know the the id of the person at the trade show you mm -hmm. know as a potential lead and then would also gather other behavioral information from the person like if gender, uh, personality type, interest level into certain products, and it would gather like kind of like this qualitative data along with quantitative. Uh, but those bots are very, very narrow as far as AI. It was like very specific. For, yeah, for the things. one I played with for Watson was really well. It was actually an implementation of big company. It was really well trained. It had been the, the model was about four years old. It was a smart sucker. Oh wow! <laughs> was, oh wow! Yeah. I told them, I'm like, I don't want to do canned responses. They're like, mm, go ahead. 
So I was oh. like, get, yeah, it was, it was good. And then I've done a few with um, NLG. Um, so just, I've, I've done a few with audio. So I just speak it in, it produces the audio. I had a startup in Portugal call me to test their NLP one. Um, oh. So I had seen some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I get some interesting calls around the world. That's like, you know, um, come here, see what you think. Cause I think people realize I have that both end of the BI and analytics and the data science. So I guess get access to see some pretty cool stuff. Very, very cool stuff. Love that. So um, when, when we originally posted this chat, um, our friend who we had on, uh, Brandy Marshall, who is a professor over at Spelman College, she had a question oh, nice. for you, Miko. She was like, oh, she's like, OK, because she has a bunch of students and she's training them on data science. And she said the data, yes. she said her question was the data technologies and tools landscape is saturated. For example, Hadoop, Spark, Jupyter, et cetera. What are the one or two technologies to learn proficiently? Like what are the what would you say would be important for her students to master when getting out of college? So the interesting part is I'm going to, I don't want to time stamp it. I'll say that before I, th I say this. I okay. will say that one of the more prevalent ones that I think that are interesting is Python. I think the reason why it's a good one is just because it's broad, it's open, and there's a lot of community around it, right? I tend to like coding languages with communities because you can learn so much faster. Um, so that would be one place that I would highly recommend that people can get their footing in. The only problem with saying that is that I went to the AI show in December and there I met a startup that was doing chart library, I mean, um, AI libraries, right? He's trying to replace the need to do any coding. Mm. Mm. So, you know, this will oh, be wow. dated God by when, right? Like soon this will be, you know, he's, he's after forget being a data scientist, pull our financial library, pull our this library, and you get moving, like your model's built. You don't, wow. it doesn't require it. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I, do, I don't want to date Ooh. this too close, but I would say today, I think Python's on fire. I'm super impressed with that community. Um, I like R. I have my personal likes. I like R a lot. And oh, she put Hadoop, she put Spark. Not a big of a hype person. I Again, because I feel like if you get your foot in in one that's open mm. and you get the foundation, a lot of these technologies are very similar. You can apply what you've learned across multiple. So I think I will still stick with Python today. Okay. N another question I have for you for data visualizations is what makes you cringe? What types of data visualizations like are you like, really? Or what are some common mistakes you've seen people make with data visualizations? So one that absolutely gets my and I do it in my course, I just pass out is when I go when I open the visualization. <laughs> I just I do it in my I do it in my course. I pull I put something on the screen and it has like a spider chart or a water like a candle um candlestick chart. Like I always do like what I've I call never heard of, I've never even heard of spider chart. You shouldn't. There's no <laughs> reason you should ever use it. This is my point. However, in light of being cool, people think, oh, this looks great, have no understanding of these types of charts, and they throw them on. So I, so, so I do a couple of sniffs. The first sniff is a chart sniff. This tells me if you're cool, and that's it. It's going to be useless. Mm -hmm. The second sniff is when I see too much green. I irk at green. <laughs> there's a problem with using green. What is people that? Put, because there's rag colors, right? There's your red, amber, green colors. And what happens is you can have the main thing going bad in red and everything else in green and human beings get a sense that everything's great when it's mm, not. Mm. I hate green. It's on the record. <laughs> okay. You're talking about pet peeves now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, this is great. Because that's very deceiving. Uh, that's very deceiving to yeah. be like that. It's an emotional roller coaster, but let me tell you the truth. I we went in, produced data visualizations, and we've had senior leaders tell us that without the green, it's depressing. Oh. True yeah. story. Yeah, I believe Not it. Once. I believe Not that. Twice. I believe that. And well, then they tell us, Miko, but every day it looks like something's wrong. And I say, well, listen, if it was right, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. No, it's funny you even say that because even like I, you know, I manage social media our dashboards automatically are green and red. Like uh, that's just, it's just straight up. That's just the way that they're built. I can't even change yeah, the we, color of the dashboards. We replace greens with grays. Um, we're very anti-green. I know that sounds mm -hmm. really bad, but it gives too much of a false sense of hope. My 
Third pet peeve in data viz is um it was just I just had it in my mind. It's greens, it's the chart sniff, I want to be cool, is trends. Mm. Ah, <laughs> get beyond the trend. If you want to see me, my, my team knows me, they see me roll my eyes. I get pretty, I get pretty <laughs> emotional and dramatic when it comes to data viz. Show me a dashboard that's only showing me what happened, and I'm done. Like mm. I just I just go. Mm. <laughs> I actually so there's a term I use in the office. It's called toilet water colors and toilet toilet water charts and toilet water use. I oh. actually call that that's a wow. term I use. I do. I feel that strongly. So when, I, when my team is doing stuff and I go, yeah, that's a toilet water purple. That's a toilet water chart. That they know, like, oh, let me just get that off the screen. Mm. Oh wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, well, the so reason I say that is. Think about it. Most data visualizations, if we go on the internet today and we go pull up what's on there, 98% of them are only showing you what happened. Mm -hmm. They add no value whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And that is something. So I started advocating three years ago, Mike, people have to get beyond the trend. Mm. Get rid of so, trend lines. So, okay. So I'm, I'm, you're, you're schooling me here. All right. So... Because I, I've created tons of trend charts. Like oh, yeah, tons people love them. them. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, you can tell a story and you can, like, show. But, you're, but so what what should, what should we do for those of us who are been trained to, like, tell the story with a trend line? What, what, what should we be more focused on? You should ask me what's my problem with the trend line. Okay. Okay. I also what? have... Yeah, I have. Okay, so I have problems with trend lines. I have problems when people put these um, uh, multi bar charts um, together where you have two bars. Here's my issue. When I look at a trend, I have to do analysis. When I look at two bars, all I'm trying to see is the variance, right? I always go, instead of making me analyze and giving me more work, just yep. tell me the answer. <laughs> I don't want to analyze and do work. Like when I teach my workshops, I, I become the user in the workshop and I warn them, I am the laziest user you've ever had. Okay. I'm literally a Gen Xer. If you make me sit on and analyze charts, I'm going to export to Excel and I'm gone. And so when I'm <laughs> teaching, I'm, I'm helping them to dig into people's yeah, EQ yeah. and saying, don't give me work. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah. Don't give me work. That's so trends right. are work. It's totally work. It's it's a lot Don't of work. Don't want to do it. Yeah, I gotta see was it going down? How fast was it going down? And on top of it, you're tapping into my subjective opinion. Just tell me the answer. Mm -hmm. Second of all, the bigger problem with trends is they show you how you got there. A lot of times they don't predict two things. Even when people do forecasts, they do forecasts based only on if you don't change anything. You know what I want to know is two parts. That's why we teach this story. Now I know how we got here. Tell me how to fix it and tell me exactly where I end up if I fix it. We skip impact. So that whole part is missing and it drives me nuts. That's mm -hmm. why the BADAS formula, formula was created. I just got tired of trends. How many dashboard trends can you build? I know thousands. <laughs> Too many. And you're right. Yeah. Super but remember when you when you build trends, what you're doing is you're incorporating an environment where you're forcing people to export the data and go into what I call pivot table heaven. Nirvana. Mm -hmm. Right? They export, <laughs> they start <laughs> like, am I lying? Am That's I lying? Right. That's right. That's right. And you can spend right. hours, days. Yeah, right? because they're analyzing trying to figure out telling a story. The trend that went down. What happened, Mike? What happened? We own the day. Why don't you tell me what happened? I don't care if you. And then the second thing that Pete pees me is when people put these things together and they look like a technical spec. Use names that people understand. Add text. Tell me what went wrong. Don't make me go on a fishing trip. Mm. So I'm very anal about context. Very anal about minimal visual, telling you what you need to know to get you quickly to action. Yeah. 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 I, I have some very, I need to write another book because I'm. It sounds like it. Yeah. It sounds like you need to do that. I love the, your sniff test. I think that's a really cool yeah. way to approach it. That That's beautiful. So yeah, well, you've schooled, you've schooled me today. Um, so I want to. I know you're busy. I want to thank you so much for your time. This has been a fascinating discussion. I've learned a ton. 
I'm going to try to not make so many. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be rethinking any sort of chart that I make uh, and thinking Please. about what, what would Miko say about this Please. chart? Um, just two things. Just remember, give me the answer, even if you have to use text. Tell okay. me what happened so I can quickly get to my job. Tell me where I'm going to end up and tell me how to fix it. If we just got some visualizations to focus on that, I think the world of data vision would change. It's too much hindsight. People are, it's work. You're giving me something to go on a fishing trip to China. Every day, there are companies that send their whole staff to China and back, and they don't realize it, and it's in an economy size ticket. It's by the toilet. Miko, we got to have you back sometime. I, I love chatting with you. Um, Thank you. So can you talk a little bit about your free webinars that you host? Yeah. So right now, one of the things that we're doing is so there's two things that we do for people that are interested and have and see things. And if you believe that trends are bad, sorry. That's <laughs> I was, and you convinced me, if Mika. You, if you believe that that too many pie charts, too many candlestick charts, I can go through these charts <laughs> shouldn't exist anywhere. If you believe that people need to take action, and I'm saying this because if you don't believe these things, this is where it cuts off. Just keep moving, okay? Um, our PNS reforming methodology, <laughs> we both implement it for companies that want help, and we also teach it. So we do these free webinars. Um, I'll give you the link. Um, off the top of my head, I think it's bibrains.com slash academy slash bi dashboard formula uh, um, or just go to bi dashboard formula.com i'll give you the link okay. if they go there there's actually a free training where i go into depth into how to create the story and i teach them how we get from point a to point b i didn't mention in the beginning we've built literally upwards of 600 plus data visualizations globally we're probably up closer mm. to a thousand now. oh wow yeah like i'm pretty i've Ooh. seen a lot oh man <laughs> <laughs> and uh, while, while you were talking, I made this graph. It's a sad. What is it? It's it's a silly. <laughs> it's a sad pie chart. Can you see that? He's just so sad, <laughs> Nico. <He> just... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> go look up candlestick chart, and you'll see why. I go look up. Listen. Go look up the spider chart, and you, I, seriously, that's scary. Why? I'm just, I'm just thinking of webs. I'm just thinking of why. Lots of lines and dots, or whatever. Why? That sounds scary. Yeah. Why? Just why? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Why? I, I, well, from now on, I'm going to be asking myself, what would Miko say about this chart? I'm going to be asking myself, <laughs> going forward, you schooled me. Uh, folks, this is Data Talk. Um, if you want to get links to connect with Miko, um, we have an experienced blog post where this video ho is hosted. Uh, the podcast, as well as a full transcription, and we'll have links to her social profiles and also links to her uh, free webinars. So you yes. can just go to ex.pn slash datatalk50. Again, it's ex.pn slash datatalk50. And that is the place where we'll have all of that. And make sure that you, whatever you do, follow Miko on LinkedIn. She's always sharing very helpful content. Yeah. I love our community. It's always pure fire. Great stuff. So make sure you connect with her there. Follow mm -hmm. her there. And uh, Miko, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been thank awesome. You. And definitely want to have you back because I learned a ton. I know our community is just gonna is going to be uh, fired up by what you said today. Yeah. Can we next time focus on audio or language auto-generated data visualizations? Maybe we can demo. Oh, them. my gosh. Yes, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> I didn't even know there was well, such a thing. We might that. have some fun. We'll put Alexa in front of you. You'll talk, and maybe she'll produce what you're saying. Or maybe if we can get our hands on that headset MIT has where they listen to your thoughts, you don't have to say anything as you think it, it'll auto-generate. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> How cool would that be? I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. in. I'm, I'm sold. All right, guys. Yeah, so we'll um, take it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks, Miko. Thank you.